I'm not here by the time you guys are digging. That's what, just feel free to take any pizza with you or just uh, throw it in the trash and then you guys know. I just started recording, so you can go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, am I good? You're good. Cool. Well, hi, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Brad with Tech Systems. We sponsor the PowerShell User Group. Uh, what Tech System, Systems is, is we're a leading IT services provider, which really means uh, we can help you get jobs in IT if you're looking. Um, and our sister company can help anybody uh, get a job in any other field. That's called Aerotech. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Tech Systems, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're the man. Let me know if you need anything. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right, we'll get started. So uh, my name is Cole Gendro, and uh, today we're going to be learning about um, how to use PowerShell to create virtual machines in Azure. Um, and we'll actually create a small script to do that in an automated way as well. So we'll go ahead and jump right in. The page that I'm on right now is um, it's a Microsoft's learning site. You can get to it by uh, going to docs.microsoft.com forward slash, forward slash learn. And um, there's more and more content coming here all the time. There's actually a crazy amount of content. Um, a lot of it focused around Azure. Um, there's already courses on containers and um, all different, uh, you can see here, even just the Azure fundamental, uh, fundamentals path is around 10 hours of content. And all of this content is actually hands-on um, it, it gives a sandbox, so you don't have to pay for anything. It, you can spin up an environment, um, play around, learn, and close it out all for free. Also, they're um, merging um, the, your traditional certificate dashboard with your profile here on the Learn site. Um, so this will become the primary place where you're, you'll uh, have your... Um, badges for completing courses as well as your certifications. So we're actually going to use one of these courses for our uh, session today. Um, and here it is. Right. And we'll step through this um, kind of quickly, but um, if any of this is too fast, I highly recommend coming to docs.microsoft.com forward slash learn and searching for the um, module called Automate Azure Tasks Using Scripts with PowerShell. So again, I'm going to kind of go through this quickly. So they're setting up the scenario. Basically, they're, they're letting us know that we work for a company that develops a CRM software application. And um, there, there's a need to do unit testing. There's actually um, three types of testing, unit integration and um, maybe deployment. Um, we'll see that in a second. But uh, it, it creates the need to regularly spin up VMs um, because they, they've mentioned that they have errors a lot of times. Um, in the VM and not this in the application and the code, and that's causing um, issues that uh, are unrelated to the code, and, and so that the focus should be on the code, not the infrastructure. So um, this is going through um, the three different tools that you can use to manage Azure, and um, they call out the Azure Portal, the uh, Azure CLI, and Azure PowerShell. And so for the Azure portal is the, is the GUI, if you were just to go to portal.azure.com. And this is uh, an easy way to get started because it's graphical. Uh, however, it's, it's not good for doing repetitive tasks. So as it says here, the portal does not provide a way to automate repetitive tasks. For example, to set up 15 virtual machines, you need to create them one by one. And so as we all know, or at least that's probably why we're here, is to um, be able to automate and, and um, get away from having to use a GUI. So. Um, Azure CLI is, is a command line interface, um, and uh, it mentions here the command support is basically the same between Azure CLI and, and um, Azure PowerShell. The big difference, um, Azure CLI is more like, um, like a bash environment, the way that the syntax is formatted, and um, all of the commands are prefaced with AZ. And uh, so here's an example of how you would create a virtual machine using the Azure CLI. Um, these are different parameters that you're 
uh, setting the values for. And then lastly, Azure PowerShell. So Azure PowerShell, um, you can actually get and work with it in a few different ways. You can work with it on your local machine using the, the base PowerShell and then loading the module, or you can use um, the Azure Cloud, Cloud Shell, which you would get to by logging into your, uh, how's it going? Hello. Your Azure Hello. Tenant uh, online and uh, launching the Cloud Shell. For this uh, session, we're gonna actually just use the base um, PowerShell installed locally on the machine and we'll connect to Azure um, from our machine. So again, this is just kind of going through um, the three different tools and um, which should be used in which case. So in this demo, again, we're gonna use the Azure PowerShell. And so um, this is now going through how to install. Again, like we mentioned, you have the base PowerShell product, which uh, comes installed on in all versions of Windows. And uh, with PowerShell Core, you can also install on Mac and Linux. Uh, and then you also need the Azure PowerShell module. So this doesn't come by default, and so we'll go ahead and download download that from the uh, Azure PowerShell, or sorry, the uh, PowerShell gallery. And uh, this is going to show us how to install PowerShell Core if we'd like to do that. Um, we're just going to use PowerShell 5.1 for this demo, um, but by all means, we could download PowerShell Core on this Windows machine. And if you're on a Linux or a Mac, you you would have to download PowerShell Core. So we're going to go ahead and click on through. Again, uh, we're on a Windows machine, and so there's really nothing to do in installing um, PowerShell. It's already installed. Um, here, it's just mentioning to make sure that your uh, version is greater than 5.0. And so we can go ahead and verify that. So we'll check by doing a dollar sign PS version table. And as we can see, we're running uh, 5.1. Next thing to do is to install the um, Azure PowerShell commandlets. And so this is actually, again, we're gonna skip through this, but if you aren't uh, familiar or you're, you're more um, in the uh, beginning to, to learn this, I would highly recommend to, to come and check this out. It does a really good job of kind of breaking down from the basics of uh, what are commandlets and what's a module and what are variables. Um, yeah, it must be on the next page, but all throughout this documentation, it'll break out a lot of um, kind of fundamental concepts, which is very helpful. So um, I'll step through this one as well. So we're gonna go ahead and do a get module to see what modules are currently loaded. And, and these are modules that are currently loaded in my session. Um, there are more modules installed on my computer. And um, I think it's Azure PowerShell version three. Um, modules will dynamically load based on if you call a commandlet that belongs to it. So um, you'll see later on, it's gonna ask us to do a, well, we'll go ahead and just go through the steps. Um, so we're gonna install the AZ module and, and this is how you would do that. Um, install module uses uh, the NuGet provider, which is um, basically like if you're on a Linux machine, similar to like an NPM or some, any kind of package manager. And so um, I've already gone through and installed this module. It does take a little bit of time to download. Um, so I've went ahead and, and already uh, done the download, um, but it would be install module and you'd specify the name of the module. And this is coming from, again, we're using NuGet and it's coming from the PowerShell gallery. So you can see here, this message is saying, um, if you haven't already trusted the PowerShell gallery repository, you're gonna get an error or a warning saying, would you like to trust this source? Um, you also may have to set your execution policy if you haven't done that already. Um, and so this is kind of just stepping through that. Um, we already have ours set and good to go. And, um, if you already have the module installed, you can do an update. Um, we're good to go. We had just recently installed, so we'll go ahead and proceed. And this is um, kind of a cool graphic of showing what we're going to be doing. So this uh, here is the module, the Azure module. Um, it's funny how it says Azure RM because that's actually the old module. We're going to use the AZ module. 
And um, we're going to import that into PowerShell on our local PC. And then on this session, we're going to connect to Azure. And uh, this module is coming from the PowerShell gallery, which is in the cloud. So um, since, uh, again, as I was mentioning, as of PowerShell version, I think 3.0, you don't necessarily have to do this import module. It'll dynamically import if we were to do a command. So I'll show an example of that. Get module is going to show us our currently loaded modules. And we can see that we, we don't have any of these AZ modules loaded. But if I was to say, um, call one of these commands, like get AZ resource group, or we'll just do that one, that works as well. And um, as soon as I tab completed and it, and it auto filled that module, um, it should have already, let's see here, no, not yet, let's see, get AZ resource group. I'm gonna try to run it. It's gonna fail because we're not yet connected to an Azure, subscri or an Azure uh, subscription or um yeah subscription oh that's interesting it's still connected um from my previous so i don't know how the commandlet to disconnect so we're going to use the handy help command and we're going to say um actually just do a let's do help and um let's see This is probably gonna be a lot of commands. Um, so it's connect-az account, which is helpful. Connect yeah. All right, so log out. All right, there we go. So again, uh, since I've gone ahead and run some of those commandlets that are in that AZ module, uh, when I do get module, we can see the currently loaded modules now includes two of these different uh, modules for Azure, the AZ accounts and the AZ resources. This one is because I ran the command get-az resource group. And this one loaded because I ran the uh, get dash or the sorry uh, log out dash az account. Um, there's a, a ton of those az mod modules, um, and so just loaded two. If we do a full import, uh, I'm going to show this as well because um, I'll show the currently in installed. I can't remember, is, is this available going to show us our installed or is there like a, a dash install parameter? We'll see. Hmm. I think that's the install. I think this is right. Okay. So um, there's a SharePoint module that's located in this directory. Here's a lot of the default modules. Uh, yeah, you're going to get this with your RSAT. But this is in this directory, and then uh, here's what we pulled from the uh, PowerShell gallery. So you can see that there's all of these, the new Azure modules, the AZ, um, which are all prefaced with AZ uh, rather than AZRM, which is the older module. Um, but I still have the older module and the new module. And um, when I actually run an import module, It gives us an interesting warning saying that um, your machine currently has both the Azure ARM and the new AZ module installed and that you can't use them both in the same session. And so it says if you have control of your environment, uh, recommends to remove <laughs> the older Azure ARM module. While that's thinking, we'll go ahead and jump back here and kind of look ahead. So we're going to connect to our um, Azure account. Mm -hmm. 
And once we connect, we're going to um, select the subscription if we have more than one. The uh, tenant that we're going to connect to only has one subscription, so we'll already be good there. All right, interesting. We didn't get that warning as I thought we were going to, but uh, that's okay. So now we can see when we run a get module that um, all of these modules have been loaded. And um, in, in here in this Microsoft documentation, it actually has a suggestion saying if you're using these often, um, you can, in your uh, PowerShell profile, um, have it so it preloads when you launch PowerShell. I, I wouldn't recommend it just because how long it took. <laughs> it's going to take quite a while. So um, again, if you have any ver PowerShell version greater than three, it should auto load, dynamically load the module as you type the command. So um, let's go ahead and get connected to our subscription. Yeah. So uh, I love MFA for sure. Pretty cool. And you can uh, do multi factor from the command line. Nice. Alrighty, there we go. And again, as I mentioned, we only have one subscription in this account. As we can see with uh, our get az subscription commandlet, we only have the one. So we're already set here. And. Um, we can look and see what um, resource groups we have. And it looks like we've got two. Um, okay. So for this demo, we're going to go ahead and create a new resource group. So our command that here is going to be new AZ resource group. We'll give it a name. And um, specifying the location here is going to um, determine where the metadata files for that um, resource group lie, which can matter for um, data governance and certain um, restrictions. Um, so we'll go ahead and create that new resource group, new AZ resource group. We'll give it a name, AZ uh, uh, RG01. And uh, we'll do West US. Hopefully, this should uh, tap complete for us. Give it a second. Yeah, it's thinking. What is what is the purpose of a resource group? Uh, it's for managing so like uh, things are put into buckets and um, mm -hmm. so if you have like so if you have like two apps would you put like all apps in the one resource group yeah. um, like one app in the one resource group the other app into the other resource group or, um, yeah, yeah sure although you could have multiple apps in one resource group um, would you be like all virtual machines in one or no it wouldn't be like that oh. it'd be more so um, this resource group has its own load balancer and these databases and these front end services or app, um, app services. And um, so uh, here, I believe it says actually the... Um, so if you, if you wanted to connect to a database from a virtual machine, they would both have to be in the same resource group or... Yes. Or no. No? Okay. Um, if it's publicly exposed, you can route to it by public IP, and you could also do um, create a like a VNet, I think, between the resources, even though they're in different resource groups, I believe. Okay. Um, but don't quote me on that for sure. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so let's see here. I think that's gonna. Okay. 
Um, and actually, the way that these um, demos work or the uh, um, modules is it actually will kind of walk you through what you're going to do. And then the next page will generally be step by step. So um, we're kind of doing it here. But um, if we were to go to the next page, you'll see that it'll tell us which locations are available. Um, so we'll go ahead and kind of cruise through the rest of this here. Um, again, we already did our get AZ uh, resources to see what resources are currently in our Azure tenant. And we actually don't have anything in here, as we were saying, we just have a, a network watcher. Um, so you could filter down if we had a lot of different resources across many different resource groups, you could specify the specific resource group to just pull the resources from that specific resource group. And then here's the uh, kind of the command that we'll use for creating a, a VM. We'll go ahead and, and look at this on the next page. Um, here are just some examples of uh, specifically for managing an Azure VM. Some of the commands, uh, remove, start, stop, restart, and update. This is an example, and, and we'll actually do this in, uh, in about two pages from now on just once you do create that virtual machine, um, loading it to a variable, um, and it'll be an object that you can interact with. So for example, once you've assigned that object to this variable, you can then um, make updates to the object. So you can change its properties and then use the update Azure VM commandlet to then uh, push those changes that you've made to the object. So um, we're actually not gonna use the sandbox today. We'll go ahead and just do it right from our PowerShell window here and, and um, use the um, subscription that we have um, and so we'll be paying a little bit, but we can quickly spin these up and spin them down and pay almost nothing. However, if you didn't want to pay anything at all, um, you can go ahead and choose Activate Sandbox and completely free uh, run here in this sandbox. Cool. And um, we're going to dive right into creating the, the VM. So again, um, oh, interesting. Yeah. They have like spot pricing, right? I think. What's that? They have like spot pricing, I think, for Azure VMs. Is that the same as Sandbox or? Um, hmm. What do you mean spot pricing? Can you declare like a spot pricing when you issue the new virtual machine command? Hmm. I'm not sure. It's like a cheaper, it's like on their unused compute. Basically. Right. And you can get uh, kicked out if it's needed yeah, kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I heard about that. I know about that on AWS. I don't know about Azure. Yeah. They have it. They have it. I looked it up. Oh, yeah. They have it on both. Yeah. I mean, oh, they AWS have it on both? Started it. Um, cool. Yeah, both um, Azure and Amazon have a, a, a free tier for the VMs, which you can pretty much run any uh, Linux distribution on that free tier and same with Amazon. So that's yeah. pretty cool. I've, I've got like two VMs running on Amazon for the past year and haven't paid a cent for the thing. That's kind of crazy. Um, so again, this is showing us we're going to use the, um, the new Azure VM commandlet. Um, we're going to specify the resource group. Here it's telling us to use a sandbox resource group, but we're going to use the one that we had just created. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to give the VM a name. We're going to set the location of the virtual machine, um, which in this case is now more than just the metadata as when, the, when we selected the location for the resource group, but this is actually going to affect performance and there's different uh, services available. Um, as well as uh, tiers of um, depending on uh, yeah what what uh, performance level and, and uh, storage and things like that are different within each um, location. So uh, we're going to call an image and we're going to use the Ubuntu Ubuntu um, LTS. I think is latest stable. That's what that stands for and. Um, We'll create a login credential for that Linux virtual machine. And then we're going to um, add an open port and uh, open port 22 so that we can SSH into it. So here's the command. It's basically just that one liner. So again, we're going to um, use our own PowerShell window here. Oh, nice. Oh, man. Yeah. Format badly. 
just do this. Yeah. All right, so. We're gonna call this guy um, AZ. Um, oh, I think it's okay if we, uh, yeah. Since we'll you're naming them, it won't matter which, which order they're in. Yeah. Yeah, well, that'll only, work. Only metal matters if you're not naming them in their positional. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what did we name our research group? We called it uh, AZ Posh dash RG. I think even this will tap complete for us if I had got rid of that um, quote. There it is. Oh, that's not the only one. <laughs> there it is. Uh, what else? Got location, credential, image. I thought I could tap complete the locations before, but that's all right. I didn't there must be a lot of choices that you can have. <laughs> and credential. So that one allowed me to uh, tap complete the image name, which is pretty cool. And we'll call it open port 22. And, <coughs> and then um, we can see in our notes here that the actually the Ubuntu Linux uh, VM requires a minimum uh, character count of 12, which is pretty good in my opinion. Uh, we'll just call this username admin. And uh, this is going to take a little bit. It's going to go ahead and, and create that virtual machine. Um, let's do something kind of cool. We'll open the Azure portal and look at these machines. Uh, look at the machine and its uh, other. Do you know if you can specify uh, traffic type on the port? TCP, UDP. Hmm. <coughs> Is that part of the virtual that, machine, or is that part of the network? Is there network? another way to handle firewall punches, though? Like in AWS, you got security groups. Yeah. Um, so you just add it to the security group to have all the rules. I wonder if there's something similar, or if you have to like. Oh, if you want to do it after the fact, you're saying, or uh... or like, is there any sort of like security? Like, can you add it to like a security group? Yeah, I think it actually is creating a, um, a network security group or a, um, a resource that is that security group. And then um, you can, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look. So it actually failed because I used, a, I guess you can't use admin as a username. And so I'm actually curious to see when it failed, did it just wipe everything or did it leave, remedy, like leave some half completed things? I have a feeling it probably left half completed things. And so the best thing to do now, I'm going to do, uh, let's just forget that one S. There we go. So I'm going to get Azure resource. I'm going to specify the resource group. And um, we had called it uh, Posh, that's RG01. Is that right, guys? Something like that. Something yeah. there. Uh, Izzy Posh. Izzy Posh. No dash. <laughs> Oh yeah, let's try it. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so it created resources and left them there for us. Uh, it created a, um, let's see what we have. This is our network interface, um, our network security group, our public IP address, and uh, the virtual network, the VNet. But the virtual machine, the virtual machine is long gone. Or is that higher up? And well, let's look uh, here in our. 
if you had an error action stop, if it would have stopped before it created hmm. part of it, um, you're just going to try it. Yeah. All right, so here's our Azure portal. I think this is the old portal. It is. Um, but anyway, uh, we'll go ahead and look at our resource groups. How do you know it's the old portal? Just it's the new one is pretty different. Um, I don't know why it is the old portal. So everything you create in the old or new, you can see in both? Or perhaps maybe I'm just used to starting at home. Yeah, this is what I'm more used to. But then you can go, I guess, go to dashboard here, and that's. But it used to always, I think, come to dashboard maybe. Or um, anyway, we'll go ahead and select our resource groups here. So these are all the items in our resource group, and let's dive into that network security group. I think it would be an inbound security rule for, there it is right there actually, for port 22. So you could probably just pre-create a security group and then just add. Right, it actually um, mentions that uh, here that, um, I think it's on the next page, but yeah, it'll mention that you can create the VM and then assign those uh, after the fact. Um, so we want to clean this up. You can do a couple of things. You can either, um, we can just do re remove AZ resource, resource group and specify the, the group and it'll delete the resource group and all of its contents. Mm -hmm. um, or you could do something like delete Azure resource and uh, call out this, this specific resource. Um, but we'll go ahead and just trash the, actually, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna say get az resource. Um, I don't know, it's gonna be group or something. Uh, group, uh, Azure resource group. <coughs> resource group name. And we call this um, AZ Bosch. Let's see if tab works, it does. And we'll pipe that to remove dash AZ resource. So this is gonna go one by one in the resources and we're not gonna delete the resource group because we'll use it. Um, so right now we're getting rid of the network interfaces. And now the uh, security group. The public IP. I think there was one more. Let's do a quick refresh here and see what we see. Oh, we're actually in that resource group or the uh, security group itself. So we'll jump back and look at the resource group. Kind of surprising that we don't see these. There it goes. But that the public IP is still here, even though we have already kind of gone through that public IP. All right. So there's a, it looks like there's actually a pretty decent delay in, in um, the resource group showing these items to be deleted. There they go. All right, let's try that one more time. So we're going to do our new Azure VM, and this time we won't use admin. We'll use uh, Bosch admin. Bosch admin. 
there's so many dashes in different places that I'm sure we'll uh, mess that up sometime. Okay. And I see the same thing now. We'll watch these new objects be created in this research group. Can we also watch a bill go up as this goes? <laughs> right. Actually, see the VM has already been created. So we've got a, um, a virtual disk. Is it better? Or yeah. Better question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, is is there a way to like link uh, like a KMS key or something for credential? Uh, I think you'd use the Azure Key Vault. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Have you used that before? I have it, but I keep hearing a lot of like they're really pushing it, and right. it, even yeah. for like you don't store credentials and you're doing right. it, yeah at all. And it's, um, it'd be cool to pull from that. Mm -hmm. Just kind of randomize it. Uh, hmm. for, um, yeah, because yeah. even in later on in the demo that we we will uh, create three VMs um, in a script and it'll just loop, mm. and um, it interactively it calls it does a get credential which i think is kind of interesting so it would be cool to, to have the credentials in the key vault all right awesome so it's completed um it's going to ask us to now uh take a look at that vm so we'll assign the variable vm we'll use the get az vm commandlet and uh Called up a name which was uh, AZ Orange. There it is. And if we just look at that object, um, I don't know if it's really going to change anything. Yeah. Um, we can see it's different properties. We're actually going to get its um, public IP address, which uh, here in the properties, it's kind of interesting. It has like a parent property with then sub values. And so for example, like for um, our public IP address, which is, Oh, okay, never mind. But uh, for example, here, like the OS disk is underneath this um, storage profile property. Yeah, right. So like within this storage profile property, there's these sub properties and you have to call them by doing something like uh, oops, storage profile dot OS disk um, to actually drill into the OS disk itself. What happens if you do a GM on that? It's an OS disk object. Interesting. So it's an object. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in order to get our public IP, it looks like we're going to go ahead and pipe that into a command called uh, get az public IP address. Here's our public IP. And we're gonna go ahead and SSH right into it. Um, Now 
And now we're SSH'd into uh, Ubuntu Linux virtual machine in Azure. Cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go ahead and exit that. So is there a root account? Is that... um, I, I, uh, the, the root admin Just account, I guess? I think it's that posh dash admin when we had... So you, back into it. you can ask, uh, elevate the root. Yeah. It's the same yeah. password. So su root, I think. su dash. Pseudo su dash. Pseudo su. No, elevate pseudo. Hmm? Do you do Is that just you? Yes, you. I can't remember this thing. Space dash. Enter. There you go. There you go. Wow, you're going to have to type in the password. Okay, now we're going to try try rm dash f all. <laughs> That's uh, RM star dash. Oh, star thing. <laughs> RM star dash. <laughs> no, don't do that, dude. You'll What's this going to do? do? It'll, It'll delete, delete all everything. files. It'll delete, delete the whole file system. All your file systems, yeah. Actually, yeah. Well, you're in you're in that folder. You yeah, have to go to CD own, root. Yeah, if you do that, forward slash star. CD forward slash, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. Now you do that. <laughs> yeah. And it'll delete the whole <laughs> file system. Oh, <laughs> yeah, FA or something? Well, yeah, I don't know. Well, uh, there's another flag to do directories too with it. Yeah, I just can't remember it off the heart. I think it's FA. You have to do recurse too. Recurse flag. All right, let's jump out of this VM. <laughs> <laughs> So there's no PowerShell function with the Azure that allows you to SSH into your host. You have to just use the SSH. <laughs> just use the SSH mm -hmm. remote in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was just wondering because because you were already talking through the Azure functions, I thought they would have a SSH connection as well, but that's fine. Maybe with PowerShell seven. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's release candidate now. It's in like alpha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so they want us to delete this VM. It does take a little bit to delete. Um, this is showing that deleting each individual resource rather than just the resource group. We would just delete the resource group if we wanted to. Um, The rest of this demo actually now goes from uh, interactively creating one VM to then scripting the creation of three VMs. And um, it's basically the same exact uh, command, uh, very simple. You just add a, uh, a loop and it will rotate through and, and increment up and add, uh, you can use that incremented variable for the name and things like that. Um, this is again, kind of where it goes back to the basics and you know, it explains what's a variable and um, what are loops and what loops um, does PowerShell support. And so this is something that actually I'd love to talk about and kind of like uh, understand more myself. What I think we're getting here is um, specifically they're going to create a, uh, a loop that only goes for three, three count for three. Um, and I guess that's because of the less than three, but can anybody kind of walk through this and explain what it's doing? Um, as long as I is yeah. less than three, it's going to yeah. go through the count. Um, so, so for here, and, and this is kind of interesting too, like what, what's the difference between like a, what's a four difference from a four each? I, I get a four each. But so four, so we're count. counting. Mm -hmm. So four. That's a real old way. Has to be numeric. I wouldn't use four loops anymore unless it's, Necessarily necessary. Oh yeah. Um, you want to use four each. Um, like load load up the ISD. Cool. Mm. Or VS Code. Yeah. I thought each works better because then you can actually have an array of names, and then you can have 
Larry, Moe, and Curl, or Curly, whatever. I can't remember the creature's name. So do you, so right Larry, click. Um, well, there's right click in the like. The, there's Larry and there's Moe. There's no, there's no, Curly <coughs> or Shamford or yeah. Tom. Okay. Oh yeah, I'll give you an example for each. For each one. So I'm familiar with with four each and going through an array, I guess, and doing for each item in the array. And then what would be what's what would four be? They were just go. They were just carrying enough. what was in the loop. Four is so the older yeah. command. It's just four right. each. Yeah, four each would be awesome because you had a computer name in a collect in an array, and you just basically grab the next name and name uh -huh. the computer that. So you right. make the virtual machine, but the four is just one mm -hmm. to four. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. setting the variable to one, and then it's uh -huh. doing a new line, doing a new thing. Checking is one is I less than three uh -huh. plus plus, which will just take increment. one plus one yeah, and, mm -hmm. so and then it'll write out whatever the value is and it'll loop. So it's after over. this semicolon, once, uh -huh. it's, once it's hits three, right? It's it's not it's gonna stop. Uh huh. And and so this semicolon is not like almost saying like okay, you're done with this logic and now do this. Um, yeah, it's almost like semicolon. Uh, a semicolon. Go, go to go back to ISC. Is that a continuation? Um, you semicolon? can put two commands yeah. on one line. Yeah. Like go up, like get a bunch of white space at the Like you could just put that all in, yeah. in one line. So you could I thought that was a character. You could get or service backslash com semicolon. Um, get dash. Oh, you're talking about like that. where you can Bronco continue the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so they'll yeah. both work. The, It'll run the, um, the first one. The grave marker. And then that comma separates. Mm -hmm. Like an additional command, and then what's the what's the difference between that and say? Uh, oh, that's two separate command. commands. You know, You're I not think. linking them together. Right, right. What's the difference between that and then that? I guess it's just uh, there isn't. There isn't. It's just okay. It's just uh, keeping it all in one it's line. Just uh -huh. One command. Got it. Otherwise, that full loop would have to have grave diggers, and whatever those names mm. are called, so tactics. The, so the. Mm -hmm. To continue on your line, yeah, line that full loop could too. work otherwise hmm. without the. Oh, because those are, each one of those is a command line, yeah. Um, so, and four can't look down. It, well, it could, be, but you know, it looking nasty with the grade with the back tick. Um, okay, so we're, uh, I get this. We're, we're assigning the variable of Darson I to one, and then um, this is almost like a uh, if then yeah. in a way. Yep. Um, yeah. It's just print present, presenting a false, a true or false. Mm -hmm. And no if true, the then it continues to the next line. Mm -hmm. If false, it does not continue to the next line. The four has to like just will stop on a false. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah, that's probably it. Yeah, that's probably right. Okay. Mm -hmm. that I mean, makes for sense. if you're using the four each, you could do four each dollar sign or i in one dot dot three. Yeah, yeah you can. Hmm. And you don't have you you just got the counter, so it goes one, I is one, two, I is two. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do all that. Mm -hmm. yeah. For each um, you can also do mm -hmm. um, you can also do for each object. So go to like, go to ISE and then do like pick okay, so hold on, hold on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Opening Do we do the snippet instead? Oh, no. I'm you, sure Tom for, that, yeah. for that you would do like do for example oh yeah input object no we don't want to do the for each uh, so do you do so do one dot dot five and then uh, for each object for each object open curly brace Close curly brace. That's gonna work. I think it has yeah. the curly brace. Oh, so you have to be piping yeah, to it. The curly brace has to be bumped up to the for each object though. That's okay. That's fine. And you might have to pipe, yeah. Pipe, yeah, you'd yeah. pipe there it. There you go. Yep. So, then, so we're creating an array. Here. And then in the in the loop, if you just put a dollar sign underscore, it would write one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Um where at in the Inside curly, curly brace. Right. Mm. Right. That's gonna say for each object in the current pipeline, just dollar print or something like that. No, you can just say dollar. Yeah, just, just dollar sign underscore. underscore. No. Oh, oh, gotcha. There you go. 
So if they had F8, it would run. And in this in this instance, the uh... oh, I see. Okay. I mean, you could even do it as um, probably in parent one dot dot five dot for each object curly braces or parent curly braces dollar sign underscore and do the same thing. Hmm. Oh, that's the slowest way of doing it. I'm pretty sure that Tom was here. We would probably say that the for loop is probably more efficient than the for each loop. The for each loop, loop is the, the fastest way. Fastest? Well, memory oh. wise or something like that. And, and the for each is you have now five different variables. Can you, I don't. Can it's, you do arrays just, though in a for loop? Can you send an array data though? Yeah, like, you can use it as a separate. This, yeah. I don't yeah. Why I use the for each is because you can send an array in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's your, why you if do your it. array is collection, um, each time it goes through, it, the first thing you're doing in whatever you're calling it, I item, this equals that, this instance equals that, each record goes through. Because if you set, like if you set set get dash service to a variable, like dollar service equals get dash service. Wait, do you want to kill your DM? You're just racking up money right now. That's all right. On my card. <laughs> and then, come on, Karen. And then, so how would you, so if you did the for loop, how would you, like if you did the for loop, you, you, you would have, have a number though, right? Yeah, so you can't you, use services in there. You, the for loop would be a separate entity. It would right. still be i equals one, blah, 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 blah. It would be exactly a death string. Like, right there. like within <laughs> that, it, it, it would something as a, as a true. But yeah. it would loop through all of services four times, right? Uh, would you would need to use something like... In services. You would make yeah, the so true or false statement something else. It wouldn't be variable. So it would basically keep, keep looping until it gets a false, and you'd, so you'd just... You would change the, the you less can than. Figure to, out what logic you want to use where you get a true yeah. or false yeah. through those things. Okay. But you would probably use like for each yeah. i, dollar sign i, or whatever, I, for each item in services or service in services, whatever makes sense to you. Yeah. yeah. Is services equals to spam? Yep. And then each. Everything that's in that one service item is a property that you could then call out as your item. Yeah, you probably use the i as an index at that point. Yeah. yeah. That's probably how that would work. Yep. Yep. Next number. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this was interesting as well, passing through parameters um, when you call your PS1, when you call your uh, script. and. Um, to do this, you actually, in the first line of your script, um, specify this parameter, and um, it's matched by uh, text, so um, location will uh, make sure to assign the location variable to the string after your uh, location. Um, you can also omit the text, um, sorry, the parameter name, and just do the, uh, the value. If you want to do this, it does rely on the position matching. So you'd have to make sure, like in this example, it's location and then size, but because they specified the parameter name, or sorry, we specified the name in uh, when we we're passing the arguments, it knew that uh, um, even though size is listed second, that five is what we want for size. Um, however, <laughs> when we drop the parameter names, it goes by position, so size needs to come first and then location and so what we're doing here creating a, a new file with a ps1 extension so it's a powershell script uh, opening visual studio code to edit that uh, file the first line is to go ahead and create that param so that we can pass through the parameters when we call the script and we're gonna um, create a parameter for resource group. So you can specify which resource group you'd like to create the machines in. Um, 
again, here's in the, in the script where it's actually going to do a um, interactive, get the credentials from the person running the script. Um, here's the loop that we just talked about. Um, and basically this is going to, um, re recurse three times. Mm -hmm. And, um, we're using that, uh, inter, uh, I don't know, iterating number or incrementing number, um, on top of our name for, uh, on top of some text for our VM names so that we have unique names. Um, and we're going to pass through the uh, parameter resource group that we received uh, from creating that parameter line above. That we can pass through when we're calling the script. Um, and basically this now will, uh, this is our next line in the script, sorry. So this is the complete script. So we're, we're getting the param that we can pass through when we call the script from the command line. Um, we're calling out to get credentials and then we're looping through and creating uh, three different, uh, so we're, yeah, we're gonna loop through three times and each time it'll create a virtual machine with that incrementing number uh, tied to the name. And so if we were to execute this, we would then get three of those virtual machines that we just created. And that's it actually, so. Um, Yeah, wait, just wait until PowerShell 7. The new deal do is asynchronously. Mm. Rack up that uh, bill. For, what do you mean, for each parallel? Or, uh, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. for each parallel. You'd be, mm -hmm. you'd be spinning up all three in mm -hmm. asynchronous mode. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually uh, yeah, did that a little bit last month. and um, So we could do it yeah, today with the preview, and it's pretty, pretty sweet. Try that out because actually I haven't even uh, executed this script yet and, and done all three yet. So it'd be interesting to see the time difference to do it uh, for each. Um, if it's not parallel, it's what. Uh, it's for each object. You just do yeah, parallel. but there's a um, there's a there's a parameter that it defaults to that um, if you don't do. Oh, you're are you talking about the, the throttling? Uh, here let's see. For each I and I's. Do something. The parameter is, uh, oh, we're in partial version 5, so I'm not going to do it. But there's no asynchronous in that without making, without going into a lot more code. Uh, process and then the process um, parameter has a uh, oh I'm sorry yeah yeah okay um, dash parallel. yeah dash parallel but by default it uses dash process I believe that that says go one by one instead of using a going and doing parallel Um, no, maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, yeah, that, that, that's really cool. I'll definitely try that out and see if run it without the uh, dash parallel and see if it creates all three ones. Um, we can do this quick knowledge check. So it says true or false, the Azure portal, the Azure command line interface and Azure PowerShell offer significantly different services. So it's unlikely that all three will support the operation you need. What do you guys think? So they mentioned earlier that anything you can do in the portal, you can do in Azure CLI and you can also do in Azure PowerShell. So definitely uh, false, we'll say. Um, this one I think is horribly opinion. Like it's, I, I don't like this question at all. Suppose, suppose you're building a video editing application, offer online storage for user generated video content. You'll store the videos in Azure blobs. You need to create an Azure storage account to contain the blobs. Once the storage account is in place, it's unlikely you would remove and recreate it because this would delete all the user videos. Which tool is likely to offer the quickest and easiest way to create the storage account? 
<laughs> I mean, I think that's very like, uh, honestly, I could probably do it easier in PowerShell than I could in the portal because, um, PowerShell is probably going to be the easiest yeah, for it's a, a lot, but, um, the portal is probably going to be the lowest of the learning curve because mm -hmm. it's click a button. Yeah. But at the same time, it's when we went into the portal, I was already lost just because I wasn't on the home page, and um, I guess it's definitely pretty easy just to click create a resource. But uh, if somebody, um, I guess the key point is uh, likely to offer, I guess, but um, let's say somebody has PowerShell experience and specifically already with the Azure module, I'm pretty sure it's going to be quicker and easier to create a blob with PowerShell than it would the portal. So. I, mean, I would agree that the, either of the command line options. <laughs> yeah, or the CLI, right. Yeah. That's a good point. It'll be both quicker and easier. That makes the answer portal because we have to assume the user doesn't have yeah, exactly. PowerShell mm -hmm. or CLI or scripting experience, I guess. And uh, what do we need to install to execute the Azure PowerShell command that's locally on your PC? Um, do we need to install the Azure Cloud Shell? <laughs> uh, install the base PowerShell product and the AZ module or install the Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell? Just the middle one. Yeah. I just did it right now. Yeah. Um, and you actually can install... Um, Azure CLI to your PC and run Azure CLI locally, I believe. So yeah, some services. Uh, Portal's good choice for one-off operations. Sweet, that's it. And actually, it's good timing. Um, six to seven, just like we said. So, um, I'm all done. If anybody else wants to share anything or ask any more questions, or we can mess with anything, I'm I'm happy to stay. And I don't have anywhere to go for a little bit, so we can mess around. But um, if yeah. not, we'll call the session. You want to cut the film? Yeah. <laughs> Nice job. Sweet, yeah. Thanks.